Hi, fellow Singaporeans. Good afternoon to all of you. Okay, today um, it's well known what we are going to speak about, but uh, my topic will essentially touch on why a decision to heritage the house at Oxley Road would not be a good for our political system. This matter has been raging on and offline for a month. Uh, much has been said and discussed on that subject, but I would like to give my views on a question which I believe would be of concern for the future. How would the decision to turn it into a heritage site affect Singaporeans? Not today or in the immediate future, but perhaps in about 20 years' time. Briefly, let us look at the current political environment and the general election 2015. In the run-up to the election, all of you know, two main issues were heavily weighing against the ruling party, namely the foreigner influx and the minimum sum retention required before CPF withdrawal. Whatever the government had offered as justifications for those policies, general sentiments were all too palpable, palpable then and needed no elaboration. Towards the closure of the campaign, Okay, we know how the campaign went. At least two ministers had to appeal to the people along the line of not to vote against them instead of the conventional and more appropriate vote for them. Predictions were indeed quite dire. But at the end of it, we know. However, the outcome on the polling day Thwarted all such predictions and turned in a surprising 69.9% for the ruling party. Despite all the negativities that had prevailed, the initial surprise and disbelief of how was that possible soon gave way to the realization of why that had happened. Most likely, it was a surprise to them also. Such was the wave of sympathy for the late Prime Minister, which seems to have turned the tide of general sentiments. It was quite uniformly acknowledged that, quite uniformly acknowledged, and it is not totally unexpected either, that the legacy of the late Mr. Lee was the cause. The tributes and accolades from the government and the mainstream media had clearly worked its magic. Now, nearly two years had passed and here we are, quite possibly perhaps resigned to a repeat performance of the same electoral outcome to occur in about another two years, despite the stark realities of us. An election happened two years ago. We know how things have progressed from then until now. And how is it going to be likely from now until another two years and we are likely to face the same outcome? So, what is happening? Today, the same issues which had been weighing on our minds are still there, unabated. In fact, more issues had arisen or had intensified as any rational-minded observer would agree. That should prompt us to ponder as how all that had came to pass. It has been widely acknowledged that we do not function as a political system based on the conventional meaning of democracy, with the establishment preferring to remain as a unique political system. The uniqueness, it seems, according they, which, according to what they seem to be practicing, is the blurred lines in the separation of powers which normally should underpin a healthy political system. Where do partisan interests end and where does the interest as people's representatives behave, be, uh, begin? Or perhaps <clears throat> they overlap. A simple question that needs to be urgently addressed is, are all these good for the country? What is going on? How could this situation be improved to iron out the conflicts of interest? The electoral system of a country, I believe, should be for the people's fair assessment of their rep representative's performance 
and to set the governing process right for a fut the future of a democratic government. Hence, the electoral process should be objective and be re resilient in that regard. The primary objective should not risk being disregarded in favor of past nostalgic sentiments, however historically glorious they may be. This nos nostalgia had been allowed to overwhelm the minds of the electorate, and most certainly not to the extent of the realities of the day, all but ignored. The ruling party agreed had in the, in the tumultuous formative years undeniably had a capable team of men who had steered the country through rough waters. The late Mr. Lee had been generally regarded as the leader of the team. Whatever the opinions for or against one may harbor regarding his leadership role. Oh, but he was not alone. All said and done, he had a good number of lieutenants too, who were comparably deserving of credit. But over the years, the history of modern Singapore has become inextricably linked to Mr. Lee as being one and synonymous. This was mainly due to the usual norm most Singaporeans are familiar with in the run-up to many of the general elections. This had almost been a foregone routine, perhaps rightly so, as viewed by governments seeking to win elections. We all know the routine. Somber music with yellow photographs and the black and white television footages adding color to the usual narratives. Sufficient nostalgia will flow to hold in high regard events that took place in the 60s and 70s. The last general election being particularly noteworthy here. Here, a logical question should arise. It requires a calm approach in arriving at an appropriate answer. While it is true, a late leader and his team's legacy should rightfully be held high to inculcate values of nationhood. All of us agree. Go ahead. But how much of a role sh should it play beyond that? Particularly, how relevant is it in determining who the key officer, office holders for the present day and the future? It is inevitable that a late leader's past legacy would be viewed sentimentally by most of the citizens. And it would not be possible to totally avoid having distorted views pertaining the present and future leaders of the country. So, it is inevitable, so never mind. Is that how things work? Here is the downside risk to our political system if more room is allowed for excessive portrayal of the past. It is widely believed that the present ruling party may hold power for some time, perhaps at least for another, ten, another decade. As much as their current policies, as much as their current policies on openness and and transparency would very likely remain in place. The instituting of check and balance mechanism had mostly been rebuffed, and their insistence for own self check, own self is well known. It is also known that the originator of such a stance is the late Mr. Lee himself. Would Singaporeans perpetually find themselves being persuaded to accept that as government status quo to honor? The late Mr. Lee, for example, being told, since uh, Mr. Lee adopted this style of governance, why don't you just people accept that style and go on in life? Would that be acceptable for the current system? The tendency would very likely prevail among the population and could be heightened during events like elections. Okay? The government in the recent years had been focused on persuading Singaporeans to accept some policy measures which could generally be viewed as counterintuitive by, counter by an average citizen. One such example being the 6.9 million population policy. All these policies were generated, discussed and disseminated in the total or near total absence of transparency. To refuse transparency would simply be riding on the accolades earned from the successes achieved by the policy makers of the previous era. It should be evident that those are past goodwill accorded to the 
accorded to them by the people upon those who had rightfully earned them in the past. In the policy formulation of the present day, that goodwill of the past seemed to have been relied upon simply too much and too often. A future leader with a dictatorial mindset could de-emphasize people's well-being in favor of instituting policy that would serve to ascertain his and his party's political longevity. A time-tested strategy would already be in place to be tapped upon by a future government. Where do the people and their rightful interests stand? Are we going to give them more facilities for portraying the legacy, the Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's legacy all over and over to the people? Okay, in view of all that, the ministerial committee should consider on the people's behalf. Would a decision to heritage the house of late Mr. Lee result in a highly political icon? A legacy to be tapped on as and when a mandate need to be sought from the people. Do we want to leave it in the hands of the future governments? This would be the question in the interest of the present day teenagers who would be in their 30s and 40s in time to come. I request the committee should consider this matter seriously. Thank you.